Welcome everybody to the Mind Right Game Tight segment. Today's guest is Nina Grubbs. Nina is a former student athlete who attended Cal State University Long Beach and was a member of the track and field team as a heptathlete. She currently is a physical education teacher as well as a CIF basketball official and a distributor slash hydration coach for Camgen Water Systems as well. So welcome to the show, Nina. Thank you for being on. Hey, hey. <laughs> So I want to learn a little bit more about your experience as a heptathlete. So for, for me, I know especially maybe a lot of us, like the only time we get exposure to track and field, if it's not something that we're involved in, is like during the Olympics every four years. Right. And the heptathlon is made up of seven events. And let me know if I get any of these, these events wrong. So it's the 100 meter hurdles, high jump, shot put, 200 meters, long jump, javelin, and the 800 meters. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> oh good. That is like a mouthful. So I want to know how did you get started in competing in the heptathlon? Like, were you doing single events as a you know growing up as a kid, and then it kind of like progressed into that? Like, how does one become a heptathlete? Right. So originally, I started track because my cousins came down from New Mexico. And in Arizona, they had the regional meet. So our region was Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado, and part of Texas. And mm -hmm. so they brought the whole team down, and half of their team stayed at my house, and another half stayed at my aunt's house. And um, I did their, I think I was like four or five years old, 75, I did their lollipop race. <laughs> and, you know, I won the lollipop race, and I was like, oh, I want a red track. The following year, I ran track. My mom signed me up, um, took me out of ballet. Now that I think about it, I wish I would have stayed in ballet. <laughs> At least <laughs> both. Um, so then I, I started running track, and I was horrible <laughs> in the competitive part. And uh, eventually, I started getting better at like a 200 and 400. And um, I guess there was... Um, not the heptathlon as a kid, they have what's called the triathlon. So it's three sports. I think it was high jump, shot put, and the 400. And one of my coaches was like, let's put her in that, or in the 200, not the 400. Let's put her in just to see. And I did good. I won. I mean, I was really good at jumping. My sport that I played and started and loved doing was basketball. Mm. And so jumping was pretty to me. I was pretty tall for my age growing up. So did that and did amazing at it and so I just continued so I went from triathlon to the pentathlon when I was like 13 and then when I got to high school that's when you start the heptathlon and so you start doing the seven events mm. so that's how I started with it all I was always got good it. at events <laughs> but not amazing at one you know so it just yeah helped for me so you mentioned you did ballet right yeah so why do you say that you wish you would have at least kept have done it, kept going with that as well? You know, it's just, you know, having that, that feminine type of activity and just seeing all the, I don't know, all the beauty that comes with it that I felt mm. that I missed out on. You know, sports is fun. Sports, you know, very androgynous in sports or what, whatnot. But, you know, having that ballet, tap, and jazz. And then also I saw a lot of people that continued on with, like, ballet and gymnastics. It kind of helped them in the long run for, like, high jump and different mm -hmm. events and sports. Got it. You know? And so you, were, so you were tall growing up as a kid, so was that one of the reasons that you played basketball as well? No, that was just the neighborhood sport. <laughs> Got it. So then basketball was it, because you yeah. first started playing basketball, but you were like, that's not for me. You had more of a passion for track, track and field instead. No, I still did basketball, but back then when I was growing up, basketball wasn't huge for, like, AAU in Phoenix or all that stuff, mm. you know. I played basketball one season, and then you're on to the next season of something. So it was always, I did volleyball, middle school, then basketball, then track. But the only thing with track, with USA Track and Field, it started in January, no, February, all the way to July. So mm. that was big then. But, you know, now that I look at basketball now, it's like, Wow, if I had that as a kid, that'd be amazing. It's like a, every other weekend for basketball now. 
you know, oh, yeah. than what I had in Arizona back then. Yeah, no, totally. I think that's kind of like everywhere back then it wasn't, you know, what it is today. You know, like literally it is every single weekend you can find a tournament that a club team can be participating in when it comes to basketball. So that's Oh, yeah, most huge. definitely. So I would assume with track and field there's a, like, certain level of mental toughness or mental strength that you have to have in pre preparation for track and field events. What personality trait or habit do you feel contributed to your success as an athlete? For me in track and field was being able to push myself. Because with track and field, it's an individual sport. I mean, there is a team component if you're adding points just to win the team trophy or some, something like that, or if you're on a relay team. But for me, going through seven events is just being able to have self-talk and to work on imagery before I really knew what imagery was. Mm. Um, so college, I learned more about him as a sports psychologist in my undergrad. But just being able to be in my own mind and do that kind of stuff really helped me as an individual athlete. And so how did you, did you just start doing imagery on your own? So you said like you started to learn about it more like in college. Was it something that you just started doing to kind of see you winning the race? Or did anybody teach you that or give you some insight to that? How did you start that? You know, I probably was taught somewhere or somebody just said, you know, go think of yourself doing that. But with the heptathlon, you always have 30 minutes in between um, each event. And even like in the high jump, it's just standing there and imagine yourself going over, you know. And it's just that repetitive in your mind after year after year, you start to grow onto that and hone on to what is making you successful and that's kind of what helped me that's awesome because I know that's big now but you know back then it was like I didn't even have a clue yeah. about that and then through your experience as a student athlete can you describe an event that took place where you um, adversity came into your life and then how you overcame that that experience as well and that could be as a student or as an athlete in terms of when you overcame adversity Oh my gosh, my freshman year was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> At Long Beach State. Year of college was horrible. So I left Arizona and uh -huh. I went to Long Beach State for college. And at Long Beach State, it was living in the dorms, being away from family. And the first semester, man, um, I want to say one of my uncles got in a horrible car accident around Thanksgiving time. Uh -huh. um, it left him a paraplegic, um, and then my grades were horrible. Mm. Um, I was on probation that year, and then the second semester, um, my cousin, oh, second semester, what happened? Something big happened second semester, and it was just, I think it was grades again, and it just wasn't working well. Mm. Um, however, I did on the on the field. <laughs> it was like everything else was going bad outside. Grades weren't doing well. Uh, family members sick. My uncle's in, in and out of the hospital or in the hospital continuously. But I ended up winning the Big West Championship for the heptathlon. Wow. Was good. Um, yeah. So then the following year, you know, we had 9-11, and then one of my cousins went overseas to um, fight the war, came back. He was all blown up from all the uh, strap metal and all the other stuff. So it was like first freshman year and sophomore year it was just like year after year there was something. And the following year, my grandmother died, and it was just, just way too much, it seemed like, during my college years. But for me, the focus was, I need my degree. Um, at times, I was like, do I really want to do sports? <laughs> my coach even asked me for a red shirt. I'm like, no, I just want to get it done. <laughs> Hindsight, I should have took that red shirt. I, I should have did it, but it was just, you know, from running track since you were five years old all the way up to 21 years old, it was like, I had a career doing that, you know, it was time for me to just like, you know, what? retire. It's a lot. So just focusing on what the goal was on the field and maintaining that. And of course, family support helped me to get through a lot of it. Yeah. As a student athlete. 
So it was mainly like, you know, wanting to get it done because like you said, that's a lot happening like outside of the sport, you know, that mentally that comes into play. So how did you keep yourself mentally strong through that process? You know, like what was it that kept you going? Because two, three years, that's a long time. You know, it's not just one event that took place and then you have your life going on, you have school, you have sports you have a personal life and you have family as well. So how did you keep yourself mentally strong to push through all that and still competing at a high level? The biggest thing was like, because my mom is the oldest of the family. So she was on like one of the major ones taking care of business, financial, you know, for my uncle. And then she had surgery one year. And then my grandmother passing, her mom passing, I think was the most thing. It's like, I don't want to add more pressure to her. I don't need to add more pressure to the family. So therefore, like my uncle used to say, take care of business. So Nina, you need to take care of business. Your business is to do your schoolwork. After my freshman year, I was like, all right, I can't do what I did before. Because if I do what I did before, I'll be done. Probation, you only get two semesters of probation. Um, and then also, it's just, I don't want to be a burden on the family. I don't need my mother to be more stressed out about all that's going on. Mm. So those were the things that helped me to get through it. Yeah, kind of almost like taking accountability for yourself at that point. And all right. the other things are happening around you, you're still going to control what you can control, and that's you. Getting off probation, you know, all the grades, um, meaning probation, and making sure that you can still, you know, be mm -hmm. a part of the track and field team and, you know, complete your education. Sounds like accountability came into right. play big time. <laughs> big lesson there. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. <laughs> so out of all the events you competed in, what was the hardest event and why? The 800. <laughs> <laughs> the 800. Um, that was the most. It's the last one out of two days, uh -huh. and running for 800, my endurance, I was more of the jumper, so middle distance was not my fave, and usually sometimes there is a point where the 800 comes down and you have to fight to get a positioning, to get a place, and so uh, that was probably one of my least favorite events. And then how do you mentally prepare for uh, your least favorite event? Because I know in track and field, like majority of the times, like in high school or maybe even college, like you do multiple events, even if you're not in the heptathlon, you're going to run a relay, you're going to run maybe hurdles or something. So how do you mentally prepare for an event that, you know, not your favorite part of it? Because track and field kind of encompasses, you know, being almost an, an all around athlete in a way. One of the things is just psyching yourself up. I remember back in the day, we used to have our big headphones and the Walkman. <laughs> Take that. Speedy <laughs> player. So, you know, it's just happening. <laughs> and so you just have your music, and you just got to psych yourself up. And um, a lot of times, especially in Phoenix, when it was hot, you would – take your music, go underneath the bleachers, find some shade somewhere, and you're like, listen to music and focusing on your next event and keep it mm -hmm. cool at the same time. So were you um, an athlete before you're prepping for your event? You're the athlete that it's like, you know, I'm in my zone, or are you more like, you know, you can, you're able to have conversation and talk and, you know, joke around with teammates and things like that before your events? I was still able to converse with people. There are, you, you have some athletes that just will not talk. Mm -hmm. that are just in the zone. I wasn't one of those people. No. And I think that's just the nature of heptathletes. We're, for the most part, especially when you're in the event, because you don't have a heptathlon every day. It's a mm -hmm. special event that happens. During the regular track meets, you'll do probably about three or four of those events that are in the heptathlon to keep it going so you can um, stay sharp with it. But, you know, since we're together all the time, it's like you have to be kind of cordial, social with each other. Yeah. You know, it just goes with it. So fast forward now, you're basketball official. So you're now you're a basketball referee, and you've been doing it for 17 years? I've been doing it for a long while. I want to say I started 
in 1998, I want to say, maybe 99. Maybe 99 I started with the Phoenix Mercury because, like, you know, the um, Mercury League, they all started, I want to say 95, 96. So, 96, I, I think, is when the WNBA the started. I think, I believe it was in 96 when they started. So, 96, they started. And I want to say 97 is they were doing the whole outreach. So, 97, I was a coach for the whole Mercury League. They tried to, you know, get more people in. And then I think that following year, I started officiating. So, either 98 or 99, I started doing that. And that was just for two, for two years within the city because it was a partnership with City of Phoenix and the Phoenix Mercury. And so I learned about officiating rules and all that. So it was really awesome because even then I played my senior year. Yeah, so it was the 99 year. I played my senior year and it's like it made it easier to actually play because you actually knew the rules and you kind of <laughs> knew what the officials and it also made it easier that you're not crying to the officials about stuff because I just officiated and I knew how hard it was to get the call right. So, you know, that's why I tell coaches a lot of times, like, you guys should come to our meetings. You should see this or you should have your players go to officials' meetings or look at the official book to understand the rules and what an official is looking at to make you a better player overall, you know. But um, – so I did that for that during high school, and then I ran track, and then I picked it back up after school was out about um, 2005 with the city of Long Beach. So I was doing off and on, but I really started doing it for high school at about 2008. So from 2008 mm. till now, I've been doing it for high school. Nice. And so when you guys have your meetings, coaches and players, it's open to the public for people to come in and check out what you guys are doing and talking about? Usually if you want to come, we'll invite people. You can come. If you want to do it to be certified, you have to pay. But, yeah, there's a lot of times where we have coaches that are certified because they do it outside of their high school season or whatnot. Like they'll, have a, they'll do travel ball um, officiating. Mm -hmm. So they're in the classes just to keep education and stuff. So it's a mix. And then there's a lot of times we have a lot of kids that uh, do it during the summers for like an NJB or um, the city league, like city of Lakewood is huge with having um, youth officials. And so they'll do it during that time as well. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's great. And I think what you're saying too is great when you had that opportunity to kind of work with the Phoenix Mercury you know, as an athlete, I, as a former basketball and basketball player playing, it's important to know the rules so that when you do have a question with the referee, you know what you're saying. And so obviously, like, they'll look at you like, okay, you understand the rules. So I can uh, have this conversation with you because, you know, you've taken the time to learn what the rules are of the game instead of just getting upset because we didn't feel like the call was, went, didn't go our way, basically. So, I mean, that is, is right. important, you know, and even myself I failed to realize. But, and then knowing that the high school rules are different from college, and then if we watch the NBA or the WNBA, those rules are totally different as well. And so sometimes we get confused and thinking, like, well, that's what I saw on it TV. Like, it's like, I don't understand why they just can't make basketball seamless. <laughs> you know, keep it the same. Football, football, most of the rules – from the babies on up, are basically the same. It's like basketball is just they want to add too much when you get to this level. Even for just college, guys and the girls, or the men's and the women's, they're totally, like, different in their rules and how they call stuff and all that. It's just keep it simple, but they don't. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> And so, like, have you ever had, like, a championship game or a high-profile game, like, maybe during CIF playoffs where the emotions are high, either it's go, win or go home? And so how do you mentally prepare for those games when, like, the stakes are so high, knowing that there's going to be a lot of emotion, not just from the players but coaches and as well as the fans as well? You know, for us and when we get to, like, playoffs for CIF, we do a lot of our own homework and seeing the matchups of both teams, understanding. Uh, what's at stake for it, even like before starting the playoffs, if we have any kind of league games that can push people into the playoffs or not. 
And it's just knowing what to expect. We even like call other people like, hey, how is this coach? What, what can I do to make sure it's a smooth game? Um, or the players, just get more background information. It's just doing your homework and being prepared for all that could happen. And I think that's good to know as we're doing this interview as well as to know that as uh, referees and officials, you guys just don't show up to a game. You also do your homework and you prepare so that you know who you're officiating. And like you said, to make the game smooth and efficient and fun, you know, so that, you know, everyone feels right. You know what's going on. Just like the coaches and the players do their homework on the other team, you guys are also doing your homework as well. So it's not just you guys just like show up and are here to blow a whistle. And then what about instances like when you make a call and then you can tell from the crowd's reaction that they don't agree with what you just called. How do you stay mentally focused and positive throughout that with like the noise coming from the fans and the coaches and staying positive and focused and not taking it personal? You know, sometimes it's hard. I, I will, especially when you're in a, in a profession that's still male dominant. Mm -hmm. um, you can even look on a lot of women's games and girls' games. There's still a lot of male officials, male coaches. Um, so sometimes that can be an aspect to it. But say, for instance, I do have a play and the crowd's going crazy. There's two things I think about, like, did I really blow it? Or was that a great call? And they just don't know what I'm calling. <laughs> and... Um, and it happens. Sometimes I do blow a call. If I do blow a call... I just have to think about it. Okay, you know, I messed up, but I can't harbor on that because we have many more minutes left or we have an important back and forth that may come up. If I focus on that, then I'm going to miss something else, and that's something I don't want to do. But if it's something that the crowd doesn't understand um, or the coach doesn't understand, I just explain to the coach, either way, this coach, this is what I saw. Oh, that's what you called. Okay, okay. Or, you know, sometimes the, your best friend as an official is your assistant coaches. Uh -huh. the assistant coaches on the team are the ones that help the head coach. So uh -huh. generally, they're really watching the game, whereas the head coach is very emotional into the game, invested into the game, and not really seeing clearly on everything. But the thing is just if I do mess up, all right, coach, I apologize. Give me one and, you know, move on from there. Because even as coaches, coaches mess up. They call a play that shouldn't have been called. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all going to mess up. Sport. And if you don't want anybody to mess up, then you better get some robots out there. I don't even know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I've always enjoyed – I mean, I, I love having officials out there because it's like you're – as a player, I feel like you're – it's like you're networking, you're building relationships at the same time because – you, you kind of want to build like a camaraderie and, and have fun too because I think that because the officials are not robots and they're human beings that, you know, natural human mm -hmm. instinct comes into play as well. And I also think like, it, like you said, it's important that, you know, as an official you hold yourself accountable and you can say, you know, coach, I missed that. I think that's important. And, and to know and hear like officials say it, they do say it. They just don't think like I'm not listening to you. And, um, and then what do you consider to be the most important characteristic to be a great referee? For me, I can't say for everyone, is to have fun with it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, if there's a coach that's irate or something of that sort, I just give them a smile. You know, that's the easiest thing to me that diffuses a lot. Sometimes coaches get mad, like, why are you smiling? You can't steal my joy. You're not going to take this away from me. <laughs> you know, uh, I understand that you're mad. I'm a teacher. I work with kids all day. I get mad, too. And you know what? I'm just going to have to smile at you because right now this is not my career. This is extracurricular. This is a, a paid hobby. You know, this doesn't pay my bills. This is something I do for fun, for exercise, because I love working with kids. And I'm good at what I do. But I'm not going to let a coach steal that from me or my crew if I'm working with one or two people. And that's the biggest thing is, like, people need to understand this is not life or death. You know, some people may feel it is. Um, some people even have a sense of saying, like, in college, this can mess somebody's career up. But that's not our fault. 
that's not us. We're going out, we're doing our job. Just because if we make one mistake, doesn't mean for that whole 48 minutes, depending on what unit or league you're working in, uh, 32, it's not on us that we are messing up the game or doing anything of that sort. So for me, it's just having fun, keeping the joy. Um, we're working as a team. I know I said before I was really big working as an individual with a heptathlon, but that's when I liked playing the team sports of basketball and volleyball is that, oh, now I'm able to communicate with somebody and we're on the same team. And just making sure the team is gelled and we are working together and we're not allowing something to steal our focus, whether if it's my partner getting into it with the coach, just pull that partner over to the side, refocus, think about what's going on, and let's, let's keep it moving, put that back in the past. And I think, you know, just kind of looking in, like looking back in hindsight as well and then listening to you speak and, you know, knowing that getting mad at you, we, well, I've never seen a referee change a call. I mean, unless we got a monitor and we can go back to a replay, right? But I've, we've never right. had the experience of, that wasn't a travel, and then you're like, you know what? You're right. That wasn't. You get the ball back. It doesn't. <laughs> it hasn't happened as many times as we all would like to say, I didn't touch her. Like, that wasn't a foul, you know? Right. <laughs> and it's like, I really did it, though, you know? But okay. still, the, the game goes <laughs> on, and as a player, I would think that, you know what? It's okay that you smile. You know, like, maybe it's a sort of, like, it's just a little acknowledgement because I don't want you as a referee to be in your feelings towards me now because right. then I don't want anything to happen where I feel like, okay, now I feel like it's personal. And now the sport doesn't become fun right. because now I'm on eggshells because maybe you and I are, you know, that little tension there has created. And so it's, you know, kind of like you said, it's mm -hmm. like acknowledging it and then moving on because we do have the next play, the next second that it, even as a player or a coach, I still have to be mentally invested into the next moment, you know, as much as like, oh, that right. play, that, now I have 3,000, now I have to sit, okay, while I'm sitting, I still have to think about, you know, supporting my team and being a team player on, from the bench, but like when I get back in, I'm mentally focused to go back in there as well and do my job the way, you know, that I'm supposed to be and not let what someone else did affect me. So, and we all know, right. growing up playing basketball, what they always say, don't let the refs decide the game for you, you know? So it's like always that, mm -hmm. like, going hard all the time, boxing out, is doing those little things, you know, during those games so that we know that, because we know referees are human. <laughs> they don't see everything, yeah. you know? And so it's kind of exactly. like making sure that we can control, you know, how the outcome comes at the same time. So right. it's good to know. I know. I, it's it's great to, to speak to an official because we don't get to hear from you from that perspective a lot, you know, and having that conversation, which mm -hmm. I think is helpful for, you know, athletes and, and officials as well. Um, and so through your experience, like as a student athlete, a teacher, also like as a hydration coach, are there any books or websites that you can share with student athletes that you feel are important for them for their mental, to building mental strength and skills in sports, also developing those skills outside of sports as well? You know, no. I, I really couldn't suggest any books or anything like that. My biggest thing is I'm one of those people that learns vicariously through others. So my biggest thing is mentors finding mentors and emulating bent people that you see that are good. Um, even somebody that's really smart in your class, seeing why they're smart. Everybody's just not smart because you might have a couple of people that are like that, but there's study, there's habits. So it's just emulating habits, and that's what I'm really big on. And so books and all that stuff is not my big forte, but emulating habits, seeing people, uh, watching videos. Oh my gosh, YouTube is amazing. You just put any subject down that you want to learn more about, and bam, there it is all right there. You know, so those are the things, two things that I feel is really beneficial to me. All right. And do you have any go to YouTube videos or names that you normally type in to kind of get that information? You know, right now it's just if I'm watching or if I'm in my basketball mode. It's just block charges. So learning about 
what people are calling for a block charge and seeing how it's going, how an official, like we talked about, may have messed up on a call, but seeing how they corrected it on their next play or just learning from those plays so I don't mess up in my, in my game so I can see. Because with basketball, just playing basketball, the more you play, the better you become because you have more trials at maybe doing um, some type of a dribble, maybe some kind of a jump shot or whatnot. And that's just like with officiating too. The more that you see certain plays, you can slow it down and have a better um, call to make that could be um, that can be very beneficial in a big game. If you see something in a big game that you've never seen before, it's just like, whoa, what do I do? <laughs> and you don't want that. So the more you have repetition, the more that you can see it. So it's just anything that you feel that you're lacking in. Some people have a problem with traveling, like you talked about before. Sometimes you see some people and it looks like a major travel, but it's not. It's just, it's, sometimes it's hard because you don't see that type of style of play and it's just hard to call it. So therefore, if you just put travel in for basketball officiating, I'm huge on just throwing the subjects in and then just watching those videos because you know how YouTube will just loop, loop, and loop. So that's what I really like to do. Yeah, I that know, rabbit hole on you, YouTube, you can be there for hours. <laughs> Yeah. And the good thing is, like, if you're driving and you can listen to, if you're listening to certain people, officials, and they're talking about it or whatnot, or, you know, your basketball unit, some of our units go have a, um, a streaming, like, on Facebook or their own websites, and so you can listen to some of the stuff that they're talking about. You know, you don't have the visual, but you can always put it in your head, player A runs into player B, you know, so you got to use a little bit of vision. Yeah, and I think that's a good one, too, the block charge. I think that's probably, would you call it one of the hardest calls to make, you know? Oh, definitely. <laughs> one of the extreme, especially with a two-person officiating crew, it can be very hard, but it's one of those things. It's 50-50 sometimes. Sometimes it's just easy to call. Some block charges are totally easy. There's a player, offensive player is just running. She just wants to score, score, score. She just runs into the defender. Easy. We're going with a charge. But some of them are just like, oh, like, what do you do? <laughs> but you have to have a call. <laughs> you have to have a call. And most coaches will say they will live by it as long as there's a call made. Yeah. The problem is that if you don't make that call, but you make the call on the other end, now we have an issue with the coach and possibly your partner. So that goes, that plays a lot into it. And that's what we do as officiate officials is pregame. And we talk about so we can be on the same accord. Because a lot of us officiate officials, we don't work together. Like mm -hmm. sometimes it's like we call each other the night before, hey, we have the game together, talk about a little few things, and then meet up about an hour before the game and just pregame on what what you're used to, what are your strengths and weaknesses, because officials, we have weaknesses in everything. And um, seeing how that official, your partner, can help back you up in certain stuff and that you guys can be on the same accord about what to do procedural-wise or something of that sort. So that really helps when officiating the game and when you need to take care of business. Thank you for sharing that there is, you know, like a pregame to it. So it's it's like sometimes I don't. I mean, I'll speak for myself. I don't think you know. Growing up, you know, I don't think like oh, officials they have a pregame the way I have a pregame. You know, where everything's written on the board and we're going over the defenses and all that. And you know, it literally looks like here they come and here we're. And now it's like good to have that experience and knowledge to everyone who's listening who might not know that you know, officials pregame like they're doing the same preparation to create a great game for, you know, the game you're about to play. I know as a team, we're looking to play a great game to win. And here you guys are in another room nearby doing the same thing and talking about your strengths and weaknesses, the same thing that we talk about as players and as a team. So it's good to know that, like, we talked about, like, there's that accountability factor going on. So that's great information mm -hmm. to learn. Because, like I said, sometimes we don't, we don't hear from the officials. You know, we don't know. We don't have those. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> once you guys come in, when the, when the game's over, you guys are running out the running out the gym. You know, you're running out. I always said I would love to have 
I don't know if I should be stealing my saying my idea out here, <laughs> but there should be like a ref TV. You yeah. know, like a channel, all the officials, various, you know, um, interviews and plays, and that would be so amazing to just watch. I mean, we have ESPN, you see it from the athlete's perspective, but to have like a ref TV from the official's perspective, that would be so amazing. Yeah, yeah. And they they started to do that now in the NBA where they have their headquarters and then one of their main officials that they had, if it's like a major call in a, like a playoff game, then they bring it in and it's like, what do we see here? And then he kind of comes in and breaks down the rules for you and then, you know, does it. But that's why I love it, giving the interviews with you as a former student athlete, but now as an official. And so like student athletes listening can say, oh, this is what's happening, you know, and these are the conversations that maybe I can get to learn more about, you know, like the officiating. So I don't prejudge that they don't know what's going on and that they don't care. Um, because like you right. said, you're doing that. You're there to do a great job. You know, that is the mission that you guys are there to do. And so with your experience through being a student athlete as well, what have you learned that think helped you propel yourself um, in your current career and pursuing your passions? You know what? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. You know, with being a teacher and being in education, when I started off in college, I wanted to be a physical therapist. And then I was like, oof, these classes for physical therapy are a little, <laughs> a little hard. <laughs> Especially my freshman year, you know, anatomy, organic chem, and, or chemistry, and then going to art oh, chem. I can't do this. And so, you know, I kind of rerouted, did sports psychology and coaching. Um, so I was still, I was in kinesiology, and I was in that house of physical education, but I didn't go the physical education route. And just being around those people and um, doing a lot of sports, because you have to do a lot of the sport activities in order to get your degree. Um, and then I got my sports management degree, and I was thinking, you know what? I want to be in sports, and I want to be the, the head honcho, so let me, I want to be athletic director. So that's why I went to sports management right after college, and think I can get into athletic directing. But for me, I didn't do enough research, <laughs> and to know that, you know, if you want to be a high school athletic director, you need to be a teacher. Like, oh, darn. Okay. <laughs> So, like, then maybe I'll do professional sports with my sports management, and then the market crashes, and a lot of the professional sports were letting everybody go. Lower level people, lower entry people, yeah, you're gone. And so, finally, I was like, all right. Um, one of my cohort members in the sports management program, she was a PE teacher, and she needed a substitute because she was pregnant. So I went into it, and like, oh. This is not so bad. So I did the seven for a year or two, and then I finally went back and got my teaching credential. All the while I was repping, I was repping City of Lakewood, and a guy saw me. He's like, you should really be going high school. I mean, you're good, City of Lakewood, but your talent, you should be at the high school level by now. And so once I started getting settled after the market, like, yeah, you know what, I'll do it. And so I think just having both that are working with youth and that I'm meeting a lot of people that are in and out of education. There are still a lot of people in um, officiating that are in education, but there are other people that are outside of education. I think just that camaraderie helps push me to want to do it and also that I'm making a difference in a lot of the kids. Like even when you see a kid outside and you're just like they're like hi I'm like hi how you doing I'm like oh you ref my game I'm like oh did I do good yeah you were good you were good you were good <laughs> All right, cool. so it's just one of those things that you're inspiring and especially being a black female and to be out there and and show that you can do what I'm doing you know it's just inspiring to me, and I believe it's inspiring to the students that are playing the sport, as well as with me teaching, showing that, you know, we are successful, especially. So you can use me as a role model. I have done this. You can talk to me, and I can help you to create your path. 
So I think, I'm not sure if I answered your question correctly or really, but I think all those kind of things kind of pushed me along to doing what I am doing all together. It's like a mesh. Yeah, you, I mean, you can hear a lot of it, like the teamwork, the camaraderie, being inspired, you know, by the people around you. Because like you said, if a kid said, oh, you ref my game, you know, being acknowledged, you know, inspires us as people to, like, want to continue to do better. Mm -hmm. And then the next game I go to or that I ref, I'm going to want to do a great job as well because there, you think that no one's noticing, but there's someone who is noticing. And if they constantly oh, yeah. see that you're doing a great job, then it's like, you know, maybe they're going to want to, you know, know how did you get here and then what else did you do because you have so much background with, you know, your education and kinesiology and then sports management. And I'm a kinesiology major as well, so I totally understand, like, how hard <laughs> um, it was with, like, and, yeah, I thought I was pre-med. So in, in learning all those things and, like, these are different avenues that you can take in sports without just saying, like, I have to be a professional athlete. You know, like, there's so many different layers mm -hmm. to sports to continue on. So, and, and that's important also with you being a teacher as well and being with, around kids all day as well. So that's, so what would be your one piece of advice to student athletes as they continue to strive for their best, not just in sports, but in life as well? I would say for the student athletes, because, like, for me, we're doing the heptathlon track and field. I would say all the sports now, since it's really not a huge dead period anymore, it's year-round. And then with track and field doing the heptathlon, I was working out in the mornings, and then I was working out in the evenings. So it seemed like it cut so much off from what I wanted to do. Like, if I can go back again, I would probably have pledged. I wanted to, you know, be a Delta, but they were always um, inactive on campus for doing crazy stuff. So it kind of hindered for me to doing that. But um, I would just say it's just, doing as much as you can because those four years they go by extremely fast they may seem like forever sometimes but those four years in sports and college goes by so fast and sometimes you're not able to take part in just the regular stuff that a regular student would do like just hanging out in the student union or uh, going to some of the events that the campus is putting on but my thing is just to network because after college, it's all about networking. And if you can start that networking in the beginning and just meet a whole bunch of people, get to know people, go to the events, expose yourself to a lot of other stuff. Because like even after I finished college, I was taking a couple of courses at the junior college and I took a geology course. I'm like, dang, if I would have took this in my freshman year, I would have been a geologist. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of those things I couldn't do with sports because I couldn't take a whole bunch of classes like some of your regular students just to have that whole world experience. So I would just say take advantage of it as much as possible. Of course, take care of your business on your schoolwork. It makes it so much easier now. Everything is on your phone, the internet. I mean, I remember we had Blackboard back in the day and, you know, <laughs> But that now is just even better, you know. <laughs> so just taking advantage of all the stuff that you have for you and uh, understand that it's going to end, but you can prolong it by doing everything that's there and networking and then taking that on to your afterlife of sports and whatever you want to do. Yeah, I, that's great information that you shared because I think we forget – we sometimes, so I'll speak for myself, like we, I lived in like this, it's my basketball bubble, you know, and so I know mm -hmm. my teammates and of course we're around each other all the time and we have our routines, you know, but it is getting to know other people in your classes who, you know, aren't playing sports because those are the people that are going to be part of your community that are going to be out there looking for jobs and you never know who they know, your professors, like joining mm -hmm. clubs. And it's, it really is, networking is so important that sometimes we don't realize it, you know, maybe during that time. But getting outside of our comfort zone right. and going to an event that maybe, like, you wouldn't normally go to, but it's like you never know who you're going to meet. And just how you took that geology class, you never know what you're going to learn and you may enjoy that could bring something special into your life and into your world, you know, to learn more about. So I definitely right. think that's, that's important as well. So thank you for sharing that, Nina. 
So Nina, thank you for being on the show. Um, we appreciated having you on, giving us that insight, especially with being a, an official, a heptathlete, and then with all your little nuggets with getting on, you know, YouTube, searching all that information for mentorship information. You know, you don't have to directly know the person to continue to learn. So is right. there any um, social media websites that you want to keep us in touch with, or if you want to give us a little tidbit on your as you being a hydration coach and then where people can find out more information about that as well awesome i'll take this time um so <laughs> so with anything of uh, being a teacher and being a sports official i picked up on a company called a magic i'm so holistic like with health i don't like taking medication and I just remember my college days of if you're sick, or not sick, if you're injured, you sprained your ankle, here, take this ibuprofen. They used to just pump ibuprofen onto you, and I'm just thinking back like, oh, my gosh, I was just killing my stomach lining with all of this ibuprofen I was taking. And so with the holistic approach, I started doing a lot of stuff from, like, um, foot baths, um, ionic foot baths, and then I learned about a company called Enagic. Um, Enad is from Japan, and it deals with water ionizers and um, turmeric supplements. And so I drank the water, learned more about the water. It's alkaline ionized water. And instantly, I was feeling better. Like, I would get knee pains like crazy. My knee would swell up from officiating um, because, you know, basketball, just the same. We're cutting. We're going back. And I would go to the doctor all the time, like, my knee is killing me again. So you're repping still, like, yeah, I don't want to give it up, though. <laughs> you know, I can't play basketball like I used to. But this is, like, my connection. I want to stay in it. And so he would just give me a knee brace and, here, here's some ibuprofen. Okay, saying this in college days. So drinking the water and working with my physical therapist, or not my physical, my chiropractor, Dr. Vanell Lucas, it really helped me to get all the inflammation out. I'm like, oh, this water is kind of amazing, all right? So I went to a few meetings, learned more about it, and so then I invested into my future um, with the water. It's a networking company, but even if it wasn't a networking company, it would have been a device I would have had because I pride myself on my body. As a former heptathlete, if you don't take care of yourself, your body will deteriorate. And especially if I want to prolong the sports, I don't want to do it with medication that can have possible side effects for something else. So that's why I chose to drink the water. Um, so I'm a hydration coach because I can teach people on how to better their body from um, arthritis to high blood pressure, diabetes, which has helped my parents from my view. That's my pers personal testimony. And then just, you know, helping other people that may have some type of eczema and Anything else that I feel that the water can assist them with. Um, as a teacher, I'm trying to teach and tell people about the information that I have. I just think it's bad that a teacher just keeps all the information in and say, go read a book or go do this. Because that's not what you're paying me to do. You're paying me for my knowledge. I can teach you how to do that stuff, but I want to give you the knowledge that I, that I know. And therefore, that's why I, I drink Kangen water. And I have a business with it. And it also helps me as a female with no kids <laughs> and no no property which is horrible you have to have a business and that's why i try to teach my kids now in my um, elective physical education class is economics we're not teaching us economics in school however i'm going to teach you guys now and we're going to take it from a sports aspect have a business have a hustle you know and have the opportunity where you can write stuff off, save money, build on it, and not just depend on a nine to five. And that's what a magic has given to me. And with that being said, I have my website. It's called um, fueledbykongenwater.com. So it's www.fueledbykongenwater.com. So fieldbykongawater.com, people can buy water ionizers. They're an investment. It's a medical grade machine. Um, with um, the U.S., you can also get a tax credit from it because of its um, listing as a medical grade machine. But for me, it's amazing. Um, I love it, and I like to mix it with my uh, foods, cleaning my fruits and vegetables. It's just the whole deal. People are like, oh, the water lady's here. I'm like, yeah. 
But I look good. <laughs> I kind of look good. <laughs> like I look at some of my former teammates like, ooh, diabetes already? Like high blood pressure already? We're just in our 30s. Like, ew. You gotta work on that, you know? So, yeah, that's my business. <laughs> FBLBiConganWater.com and Twitter is Nina. Um, Nina24 and Instagram Nina G. And so yeah, that's that's me and all that I do. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. And I want to make sure I'm gonna have your your social media handles and I'll have your website as well. It'll be in the description of this video so that if you missed any of how what that website was, it'll be in the description so you can go ahead and click on that to learn more about the Kongan water. So Thank you, Nina, for sharing that. One last question before you go. You just have to finish this sentence. I am grateful for. I am grateful for my family and their assistance in making me better. Awesome. Thank you once again, Nina, for being on. I appreciate you having on the Mind Right Game Tight show. And um, we look forward to, <laughs> yeah, no problem. And then anything else you want to continue to share with us that's going on in, in your world and you know, empowering student athletes all over the world as well. Just let me know. I love to have you back on. So uh, have a great day and treasure yourself and shine. Thank you too.